All right, y'all, welcome to the show. It's Anti-War Radio, Chaos 95.9 in Austin, Texas. I want to uh, send some thanks out to Bianca Oblivion for covering me, covering for me last week as I was out of town. I was lucky enough to be invited by the Young Americans for Liberty at the University of New Hampshire to come give a short speech and introduce Tom Woods, which is what I'm about to do for you right now. Tom Woods is a senior fellow at the Ludwig von Mises Institute. He's got his uh, PhD from Columbia. He's the author of a ton of great books. Uh, uh, The Church Confronts Modernity, The Politically Incorrect Guide to American History, How the Catholic Church Built Western Civilization, Who Killed the Constitution, The Church and the Market, 33 Questions About American History You're Not Supposed to Ask, Meltdown, A Free Market Look at Why the Stock Market Collapsed, The Economy Tanked, and government bailouts will make things worse, and we who dared say no to war, American anti-war writing from 1812 to now, which he co-edited with Murray Polner. Welcome back to the show, Tom. How are you doing? Uh, doing great, Scott, which reminds me, you should get Murray Polner on the show one of these days. You would love talking to this guy. I should. In fact, now that I think about it, I think maybe I was supposed to one time and screwed up and forgot. Well, yeah, well, I'll take your suggestion. It's an excellent book, and... Um, I was asked uh, by a young aspiring journalist there in New Hampshire, which is my favorite of all of Tom Wood's books, and it is We Who Dared Say No to War, American Anti-War Writing from 1812 to Now. And it's uh, really great stuff. And in fact, if you Google around on the Internet, you can find commies who don't like it because it doesn't have enough communism in it. Uh, but other than that, it's perfect. Everybody else on the left likes it, except there's a, there's a Marxist who really, really doesn't like it, precisely because, as you say, it, it includes all kinds of people who are against war, and normal people think that would be a good thing. But yeah. you know, I guess well, not maybe everybody. you guys didn't really bend over backwards to make sure that the most commie people were quoted as well. Well, our view was that if, as long as you're not a commie or a fascist, we'll put you in the book. You know, so I mean, we even had Helen Keller in there. You know, and she, she's pretty far on the left yeah well and you know communists are actually pretty good on american empire usually unless they're trotskyites in which case they're the biggest imperialists of all but i guess that's a whole other topic yeah, that's actually that's other. not a whole other topic that's what i want to talk with you about <laughs> okay communism 20 years ago right about now the damn thing started tearing itself apart by christmas 1991 it was done and uh well gee i wondered tom Why did the Soviet Union not last? I mean, I got to tell you, when I was a little kid and I first learned about the Cold War and the nuclear weapons pointed at each other and this massive Iron Curtain and this Soviet empire that dominated Eurasia, this was a permanent thing. I was led to believe, uh, I think pretty much everyone believed that the Soviet Union was going to last throughout our lifetimes. And uh, then I remember being still a young kid and saying, wow, Dad. This is really the history of the world being written right here in it as the wall was being torn down, and we watched it on uh, Tom Brokaw at night. Yeah, it's true, Scott. I mean, people did have that view, but it's interesting to look at the conglomeration of people who held that view that the, the Soviet Union is just part of the permanently part of the landscape, and it's just going to be there, and it's a big, strong behemoth. It was two different groups uh, that were sort of mutually contradictory, yet who took the same view. One would be the John Kenneth Galbraith fashionable left liberals who were, uh, you know, who of course were not communists, but nevertheless they thought it was really very lowbrow to be just outright against central planning. So as late as 1984, appropriately enough, Galbraith was saying that the Soviet Union is on the verge of surpassing the West in production and it's, it's as vibrant as ever and so on and on. But then on the other hand, on the other side, you've got the neocons who have a different reason to trumpet uh, Soviet success, which is to scare us to death, right? To scare us into buying into the gigantic uh, profiteering going on in the military-industrial complex. And so there is, uh, we now know, uh, starting in the 70s in particular, although really you could go back to the the uh, late 40s, early 50s already, uh, NSC 68 and that stuff, there clearly was a, 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 a dramatic overestimation of Soviet capabilities. So it's interesting to note the people who were skeptical that the Soviet Union was, was going to last. One of them is uh, Tom DiLorenzo, who was a professor at Loyola. Now it's called Loyola University in Baltimore. His friend Jim Bennett came back from a visit to the Soviet Union in the 80s, and he said, 
we have nothing to worry about. This country is one giant department of motor vehicles. <laughs> <laughs> nothing to worry about. Uh, likewise, Yuri Maltsev, who was an advisor to Gorbachev in the 80s and then finally defected to the West. I mean, he came over and said, you people have been fighting a paper tiger. Like, why would you think mm. the mere fact that it produces a lot of steel and concrete, you know, in an age of, of computer chips is really not that significant or that the United States, you know, by the mid to late 80s had 25 million personal computers and the Soviet Union had 150,000. I mean, this is not even close to a competitor. And so so the thing collapses simply because it's a, it's a command economy. It has no way of responding to consumer demands and no particular desire to. Why would you bother if, if, it, if, if you're the central planner? Who, who the hell cares? People take what I give You'll take what I give you and you'll like it. Hang on a second there, Tom. I want to I get into the economics of, of communism and why it didn't work. Why the, I mean, and you know, the left-wingers will say, well, it wasn't really communism. It was sort of fascism, and that's why it didn't work or whatever. But we can get into all that. But I want to talk about a little bit of this history here that you discussed. Uh, you know, uh, the great reporter Robert Perry uh, from ConsortiumNews.com, he has done such great work on Team B, that group of neocons that you talked about. That's what who, I was thinking of, right. Uh, they were the ones who went and dug through the CIA's trash to put together a story, to cherry-pick together a story about how the Soviets have all these submarines that we don't know about. And in fact, the reason we can't find them is just proof of how silent and sophisticated they must be. <laughs> and they have all these nuclear weapons and all of these things. And how, um, and you know, Robert Perry really says that this blinded, uh, you know, you know, half a generation or something. You know, the whole through the whole Reagan years, there's so many people that have bought into this. That uh, Bob Gates, our current Secretary of Defense, he was really uh, one of the head guys politicizing this intelligence on the Soviet Union, and was uh, at the time of the fall of the Soviet Union, he was the director of the CIA, and com was completely taken by surprise because he had worked so hard to lie to us all that time. That's, this is Gates, our current Secretary of Defense. Uh, which I think is really interesting. But another thing that Perry said is that in the 1970s, the American and Soviet establishments were coming to an understanding that we can only do so much brinksmanship here. And uh, led by Henry Kissinger and Richard Nixon, the American policy was detente with the Soviet Union, the cooling off, I guess. I forgot what language that is. But basically, peaceful coexistence. We understand that there's going to be a Soviet Union for as long as there's going to be one anyway. And so maybe we can ratchet down some of this Cold War. But then when the Reaganites came in and wanted to ratchet the Cold War back up again, uh, the way Bob Perry says it is the Soviets didn't want to play anymore. They were broke, and they knew they were broke, and they were tired of this game. And I guess the right-wingers, maybe they knew they were lying. They were trying to bankrupt the Soviet Union by forcing them to play the brinksmanship game that they didn't want to play anymore. Although maybe they were just trying to sell bombs. I don't know, Tom. It, it, they sure seem to be taken by surprise for their strategy working so well. You know, it's interesting, Scott, that on the one hand, the the right-wingers you're talking about are the ones who supposedly are the most free market, anti-communist from an economic point of view. So they should be the ones who would most expect the thing to collapse. Like, don't don't they believe what they're saying? Like, don't they believe their own principles that if you organize an economy like this, it's not going to work in the long run? Uh, and yet you're right. Yeah, they're just completely taken by surprise by this. But that's precisely why... The so-called old right, uh, the the pre-neocon, uh, pre-super uh, duper militarist right. Uh, that's why they weren't interested in getting involved in a cold war because their view was this thing is going to is unsustainable, obviously. And if it wants to build a giant empire around the world, well, every single country it's going to add to that empire is also going to be an economic basket case in need of subsidy. I mean, let it do that. If that's what it wants to do, it wants to bankrupt itself. I mean, it's bad. The U.S. bankrupts itself, but uh, the Soviet Union would be bankrupting itself even worse. I mean, who wants to be, who wants to add Vietnam to your, at least communist Vietnam, to your, your, your basket of, of uh, imperial conquests? I mean, every single one of them is going to be a basket case. 